Welcome to the Westboro Historical Society program. We're very excited about this program because it should be lots of fun. I'm Chris Allen, uh, program chair of the Historical Society, and tonight our president, Kathy Cavalieri, luckily is down in Florida, <laughs> missing the snowstorm. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to our calendar. It has changed rapidly because within about a week we got a cancellation of a program on early shoe industry. And luckily I was able to contact Chris Daly and he was able to do the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age night. So we we're very fortunate that he could step in. Um, the other programs are listed. Usually it's the first Monday of the month, and most times at 6.30 in the library meeting room here, uh, and go until 7.30, quarter of eight. So you're welcome to all, the, all our programs. They're all free, and we really would love more and more people to come to our programs. We're fortunate also that Westboro Cable TV does record these programs on the local TV channel. So therefore you can see them after the show or if your friends or husbands did not want to come tonight but might like after they hear how great it was uh, to look up the Westboro website and past programs are there. So you will be able to see this program on our website. So please take this home, enjoy it. There's one other correction in that on Saturday, May 11, which is, is going to be a journaling your history. And usually we're Monday, but this happens to be a very special program by Professor Mary Botticelli, I love that. Mary Botticelli Christensen, who is a professor at the University of Hartford, and she is going to be running a workshop on how you do your own journaling and make your own history. It is limited to 10 people, will be held at the Westboro Historical Society, right up the street, 13 Parkman Street. So if you're interested in learning how to journal your own journey in history, uh, do sign up for that. We also will be having um, an open house. We have open houses about four times a year, and the next one will be during Westboro Unplugs Week, and that will be on Sunday, April 28th, from uh, 1 to 4. Again, totally free, and we hope you'll come because we have four rooms of artifacts that go back to the 1700s when the town was founded. And each century has a room. And the curator is Leslie, so that, and we have very fine docents. So we hope you will be able to come on um, May or April 28th. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Daly. Is he gonna come, wanna come up or you're back there? Sure. Um, Chris is a historian, an author, and public speaker. He recently retired from a 25-year career teaching history in the Silver Lake Regional School System in Kingston, Massachusetts. He holds a BA and an MA from Bridgewater State University uh, in political science and history. He was formerly the president of the Pembroke Historical Society and chairman of the Pembroke Historical Commission. Chris has written articles on historical topics for local publications and recently published his first book, Murder and Mayhem in Boston, <laughs> Historic Crimes in the Hub. So that should be fun. Chris has also served as historic consultant on the Sacco Vincetti case for Travel Channels, The Travels or Traveling with Brian Unger. 
and has appeared on Travel Channel's Kindred Spirits program. As a historian on his specialty, the Lizzie Borden case. <laughs> I, you're pretty macabre there. <laughs> this is one of the lighter ones. <laughs> okay, um, Chris and his photographer wife, Kathy, have traveled two and a half hours tonight oh, wow. from Bethlehem, New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire, wow. to be with us tonight. Oh, wow. So we're very, very fortunate to have Chris Daly here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. a great introduction. <laughs> um, when we think of the Roaring Twenties, what do we think about? Flappers. 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 Jazz. Jazz. Yeah. Flappers. Parties. Parties. Drinking. 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 <laughs> it was illegal. What are you talking about? Uh, Anything goes. Flappers. Oh, can you stand up? Can I stand up? I want you Barely to show everybody your flapper dress. <laughs> um, Isn't that the bee's knees? <laughs> 30 years ago, I wore this dress. So you know. <laughs> and it's the, the 1920s time. all over again. What do you know? At least it goes around <laughs> Well, have you ever thought if I could get into a time machine, what time period would you go to? The 1920s. Yeah, yeah there was a lot going on, a lot of fun things. The flappers, the parties, the the bootleg hooch and the speakeasies, all that stuff. There's a lot of other things going on that nobody wants to talk about, like lynchings and the Ku Klux Klan was out of control. We're going to cover the whole thing. And it's, it's not very in-depth. This is a nice superficial look at the 1920s. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, hold them to the end and we'll do a nice Q&A. Uh, last time I did this, I had some great questions. Some people actually told me some things I didn't know. So uh, without any further ado, let's get going here. OK, thank you. So when you talk about the 20s, uh, it really doesn't begin in 1920. It begins at the end of World War I. Uh, this period we call the 1920s, the Roaring 20s. And I say a nation loses its innocence because they went through this. this is an actual movie clip of the trench warfare during World War I. Now, we entered this war on uh, April 6, 1917, and American soldiers under John Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, arrived in large numbers at the Western Front in 1918. During the war, the U.S. mobilized over four million people, and they suffered 110,000 deaths. Now, when I was looking at this, uh, I was shocked. Out of the 110,000 deaths, 43,000 were due to the Spanish flu. Wow. Yeah. Now, do you recall before COVID, people would say, I've never heard of the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. Now you know why. Do you want to talk about COVID? These probably people went through this, and they didn't ever want to talk about it again. So a lot of those deaths were due to that flu, but a lot were due to battlefield injuries. And a lot of these men came back to America with this uh, live for today attitude. You know, to, the kids call it YOLO today. And they had that, you know, live to, you know, you only live once, so live it to the max. And this is where we get the roaring 20s. Now, when they came back, uh, they also came back to a nation that was going into a recession. And it was going into a recession because all the factories had been retooled to make weapons, tanks, all these armaments to fight the war, and now they had to retool and go back to whatever they were making. A lot of these men came back and their jobs were gone, and there was a lot of competition for labor. And here's a shot of everybody coming back here. Imagine that, you leave, you serve your country, come back, uh, factory job is gone. Most people worked in factories or on the farm. And here's some shots of the, the parades. All those heroes coming back. So we start off the 20s, like I say, it really didn't start in 1920, with a lot of labor unrest. And the first thing we have is the Great Steel Strike of 1919, where uh, the Great Steel Worker Union, the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel and Tin Workers, organized 
the United States steel industry. Now, shortly after Armistice Day, uh, they began to see a lot of harassment from the companies. Uh, permits for meetings were being denied. This is like town governments, city governments doing this, working with the companies, and they couldn't rent halls. Pinkerton agents started uh, arresting union organizers. Now, a note here, mind you, today unions are perfectly legal. You have the right to strike, you have the right to collectively bargain. None of it was legal at this point. Uh, all you could do, all you could hope for, is to go on strike and hopefully you didn't get your skull smashed, and maybe your, your company would recognize your union. There were no protections back then. So this is what happened. They went on strike, and let me get the date here. I think they went on strike May 25th, 1919, and the steel unions, the steel companies, didn't realize the power that they have. They shut down the steel industry. And this went on. And you can see here, here's some shots of the men going out. This was all over the country. And you can think of uh, you know, Pittsburgh, the steel mills. Uh, there were mills in Chicago, Illinois, Wheeling, West Virginia, all over the country. This is what they wanted. They wanted union recognition that the company would collectively bargain. Shorter working hours. Most of these guys worked six days a week, probably 12 to 14 hours a day. And that's all they were looking for. That's all they were looking for. But the company didn't see it that way. They saw that as lost money. So they started doing, they had, had a bag of tricks here. One of the bag of tricks was, let's associate the unions with the Bolsheviks. For those of you who don't know, during World War I, the Russian communists, who would, they would later be called the communists, the Bolsheviks took over Russia. Eventually they killed million, millions of people, the Tsar and his family, and there was a bad taste in people's mouth from the Bolsheviks in America. They were afraid that this revolution was gonna come over here. So it was good for the companies to say, oh, that union, they're, they're communists, they're, they're Bolsheviks. So this would change people's attitudes towards the unions. And also, they were allied with the police. The police were just hired to come in and break strikes. Nothing illegal about it. And in a lot of cases, they call out the National Guard. And as you can see, the Union's up against this. In addition to the Pinkertons, who were, uh, you know, they do things like just murder people. Uh, up against that, they failed. It collapsed in January of 1920. Here's an advert in a paper, kind of, uh, go back to work. Notice all the different languages of all the different workers here. Go back to work, you Bolsheviks. And then here's one closer to home. The Boston police strike of 1919. Yeah. And it's pretty much the same situation. The police had these god-awful hours. Uh, they weren't called 24 hours a day. They still are kind of like that. But uh, they had a small police force. And uh, they were looking for the same thing, recognition of their union improvement of wages, their wages were really low, better working conditions, so they had better hours, and they went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with the city of Boston, trying to get these things with their own group. They were loosely unionized, and then they, then they uh, affiliated with the AF of L. And before you knew it, uh, bargaining had broken down and they went on strike. And for three days, there was bedlam. Can you imagine it? September 19th, 1919. Uh, no police. Looting was rampant. There were crowds of people beating people up, robbing them. It's said that there were gangs of people, kids in the streets, just playing craps right out in the streets. Uh, it, was, it was bedlam for three days. I'm surprised they let it go that long. And these are just some shops that were looted. Here's, here's a cartoon from the period. So all, the public is basically blaming the police for going on strike here. Your, your, uh, our buddies, see the crooks here? They're helping out the crooks. That's how the public was made to look at the police for trying to get a living wage. 
And then finally, the governor of Massachusetts, Calvin Coolidge, stepped in with the uh, the national well the uh, the reserves, the National Guard, uh, state the state guard, and uh, his his famous quote. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. This would be echoed in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers because they worked for the government. And they went back and forth a little bit. What are we going to do with these men that walked out on their duty? And the decision was finally made that they would just fire them all. And here are, here are some um, pictures of some of those men that lost their job forever. They didn't think that this would happen. They thought eventually they'd, they'd go back on the job. But what they didn't think was there were ready-made cops just home from Europe, ready to go in and take their jobs. And that's what happened. And then in Seattle, there was the Seattle general strike. And it started with the dock workers of Seattle and uh, they went on strike. Same things, pay increases for unskilled labor, recognition of the union, and it turned into a general strike. You don't hear about general strikes anymore. This is when one section of the economy goes on strike, but all other sectors go on strike in sympathy. What leverage that is, isn't it? Like in Seattle, all the unions went on strike. It shut down the city, literally. And you would think that, wow, that's a lot of leverage. That, that means they could probably get whatever they wanted. They're holding the city hostage. And the old playbook comes out after some, uh, some scuffles in the streets. We start to see things like, Russia did it. <laughs> Russia's behind this. And believe it or not, the strike failed. The strike failed because the mayor of Seattle, Ole Hansen, came in and he called in federal troops. He threatened all the strikers. He said, look, if you don't come back to work, I've got all these people here ready to take your jobs. What are you going to do? And, and the strike failed. After six days, it was crushed. So I alluded earlier to the Bolsheviks. And this, this was in the psyche of the country. We, we knew over in Russia this happened, that these Bolsheviks, these communists, had taken over Russia. They had Vladimir Lenin, who was a great demagogue. He could really fire people up. And he did that in Russia, he and his communards. And back home here, we had our own crop of demagogues. Most of them were foreign Radicals, that's what they call them, radicals, or reds. Funny thing was, this group they called reds were communists, socialists, anarchists, uh, a whole spectrum of political thought here. But they all lumped them in as reds. And here what you have, you have the, the main leadership of the anarchists. And anarchists don't believe in leaders, by the way, but these are the, the people that they follow. And they were out on the streets with the socialists and the communists trying to fire up people for a revolution against the country. It was happening. People were afraid this revolution was going to happen here. These are just some shots of people out there doing political speeches. Free, freedom of speech. And this stuff started happening. Now, there were 36 mail bombs sent out to people like Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, uh, leading government officials, judges. They, they were mail bombs sent to them. A lot of them were in, intercepted at the post office. The only person to be injured in this attack was a, a maid of one of the leading capitalists opened up the mail and blew her arms off. Now, I don't know what these guys are thinking. I don't, I don't think uh, John Rockefeller opens his own mail. Uh, but this is, the, they were trying to ignite a revolution by doing things like this. They thought doing this, would, people would arise up and fight against the country. And then another, mail, uh, another bombing 
Uh, simultaneously in June of 1919, there were eight cities that had bombs planted. And then this happened. Uh, this is Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. And uh, I think it was in June of uh, 1919. He and his wife are getting settled in their townhouse in Washington, D.C., getting settled for the night. Uh, she was in bed. He had sat down. He had a nice book. He was all ready to read. The kids were all tucked in. And all of a sudden, boom! Everything's just in disarray. The, the chandelier falls on the bed. There's glass flying everywhere. And, and what happened was they actually escaped death through dumb luck. There was an anarchist bomber who was going to place a bomb in the foyer or the front porch of his house. He had the bomb. This is at night, mind you. He's walking up the walkway. You know the little cement lines? He tripped, fell on the bomb, blew himself to smithereens. They found pieces of his body all over the neighborhood. Uh, found his scalp on the roof of the Secretary of Navy. You might have heard of him, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> Here's another shot of that. So what this did, it caused the Red Scare. And E. Mitchell Palmer and the government kicked into action. They started rounding up any foreign radical that they could find. And the Bureau of Investigation, soon to be the FBI, knew all their names, believe it or not. And they stuck them on ships and sent them back. Now, one of these ships they called the Soviet Ark. And this is, this is actual newsreel footage of these people being just rounded up, put on a ship. They sent them all to Russia. Even a lot of these were people are Italian anarchists, and they had nothing to do with communism either. They abhorred communism, actually. It was the antithesis of what they believed. So they sent them all to Russia. Here's another cartoon showing how they handled that. Now, Woodrow Wilson helped end World War I with his 14 points, different stages to end the war and bring peace. Part of the 14 points was to establish a League of Nations, much like our United Nations. This was the progenitor of the United Nations. And this was his baby, and he set it up. The, uh, the countries entered into a, uh, a treaty to establish the League of Nations. This was Wilson's thing. And his 14 points were the basis of the League of Nations. <clears throat> Problem was, once he entered into the treaty for the United States to enter into the League of Nations, that had to be ratified by the US Senate. They didn't ratify it. <clears throat> and we never ended up in the League of Nations. This started a period of isolationism this means, uh, maybe this sounds familiar, America first. <clears throat> America first, we're, we're not going to get involved in your business. We already got sucked into that war. We had no business being there. Just go about your own business and do your thing. We're going to take care of things here. In hindsight, that was a big mistake because maybe if we'd been involved in the war, you wouldn't have seen the rise of Hitler, Mussolini, <clears throat> Franco. So uh, this, this period of isolationism starts. And also, you see something else around this time, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> this wasn't your old Nathan Bedford Forrest clan from the Civil War. This was the new clan. They not only hated uh, Northerners and freed slaves, they also hated anybody from another country that was a new immigrant. Uh, Catholics, Jews, and also, yep, they still hated their old enemies. So they were the, the new improved clan, I guess. There were four million members of the clan in 1924. <coughs> These are some clan rallies. Look at that. Where is that? Dayton, Ohio. That's not Georgia. 
That's not South Carolina. I had a lady come to me after one of my lectures, and she's, she was from Vermont, and she said, we were just cleaning out my father's attic, and her father was from this time. Guess what they found in the attic? A clan suit. So it was all over. Look at this. This is a march on Washington. It took place August 8th, 1925. 30,000 members, 22 abreast, 14 rows deep, paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. I don't know whoever came up with that outfit. <laughs> in, my, in my school, it was a dunce cap. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and you can see their faces, too. I guess they weren't embarrassed. With the rise of the Klan, you saw this. Lots of lynchings of black men. Between 1920 and 1929, there were 281 documented lynchings of black men. These are postcards, folks. They'd send that to their relatives. This was also a time of immigration and xenophobia, xenophobia, fear of people from other countries. You can see here from some of the cartoons. Don't let them in, they're probably radicals. And here's an anarchist ready to stab Lady Liberty. America's melting pot. And this is how they dealt with it. Let's, let's shut off the spigot, in other words. And they did do that. There were laws passed to limit immigration. This wouldn't be changed until the 1960s. And Woodrow Wilson goes out. There's an election. And we have a new president, and his name was Warren G. Harding. Now, he wasn't, I think they had 10 rounds at the convention, the Republican convention, to try to pick a nominee, and they couldn't agree on anyone. And so in the back rooms of the convention, the smoky back rooms, a deal was made, and they came up with Warren G. Harding. And he had an interesting way of campaigning. Uh, this is his home in Marion, Illinois, and he would just come out every morning, make a speech, and go back in his living room. <laughs> Maybe that's good, instead of seeing all these ads on TV. How many people are sick of those ads already? <laughs> Nikki Haley. Okay. Uh, that's the one that I keep saying. And if you want to visit it, that's his home. It's at 380 Mount Vernon Avenue in Marion, Ohio. Now, he was... Uh, inaugurated on March 4th, 1921. Inauguration was a little bit different. Uh, it took place in March. Now, uh, he didn't want a big to-do. He said, uh, let's not do the parade. Let's just gather, I'll make a speech, and we'll have a little party afterwards. And he did that. And uh, as I looked at his speech, I was astounded to find this quote that he said uh, during his inauguration, our most dangerous tendency is to expect too much from the government and at the same time do little for it. I'm thinking JFK, who was a great historian, kind of lifted that a little bit and changed it to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So, and then we have prohibition. Oh, I love this slide. <laughs> I got in trouble for this my last lecture. A lady said, she said, um, well, you know why it was all those old ladies? It's because their husbands were coming home after payday and drinking up the paycheck and then beating them up when they got home. Okay. So I had to put that in there. So I said, I'll put that in my next lecture. Uh, the Temperance Society actually began very early in America. It started in 1826, the American Temperance Society. Many towns and cities across America were already dry. Still are. Some of them still are. And... Uh, a resolution was passed 
1917, uh, December 1917, by both houses. Uh, it was introduced, I should say. By January 16, 1919, an amendment had been ratified by 36 of the 48 states. Yes, there were 48 back then. Making it law. Now, on October 28, 1919, Congress passed the enabling legislation, the law that's going to enforce this, called the Volstead Act. This created the prohibition agents. And it went into effect in 1920. And here's a newsreel of them dumping out all that alcohol. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. How many people are crying? Oh. And of course, this, this was supposed to cure all of society's ills, just like I said. This will stop those husbands from wasting their paycheck at the bar uh, it'll also stop domestic abuse, crime. This is like the alcohol was the root of all evil. But they got it wrong. Because all it did was create a black market and more people stuck. America was already, I think, the biggest consumer of alcohol on the planet. And now it just it skyrocketed with this illegal alcohol. Now it's kind of bad to do it. And you started seeing uh, stills popping up <laughs> all over the place. And this is neat, this is Jimmy Cagney in uh, the Roaring Twenties, and they're making bathtub gin. Now to make gin, you have to use several chemical components, and it has to be done in a big vat. So the biggest vat they had was a bathtub, and a lot of people would make this, but they, they wouldn't make it correctly. And when you read the newspapers in the 1920s, you come across these articles about a uh, whole group of people got sick from the gin. So this was probably the cheapest alcohol you could get. A lot of poisonings. And then there were the rum runners. And this started in the Caribbean. And they were running rum from the Caribbean up into Florida, kind of like the drug trade today. But you know, rum was cheap. It wasn't really lucrative. It wasn't until the whiskey runners started bringing whiskey in from Canada, also bringing champagne in from uh, France. This was where the money was. I was astounded. Uh, one of these ships, a cargo would, would be worth $200,000. And I'm thinking, oh, that's 1920s money. That would be $3 million today. And everybody wanted to get in on it. Here's some neat ways of smuggling whiskey across the Canadian border. If you look here, this is a spot where there's just, I guess, a, a thin uh, peninsula where they, they can actually sneak it under the water here. They had like a rope and they just bring barrels of it with, with a diver. That was one way they did it. And of course, uh, they just put it on those ships and bring them in at night. We hear these stories about on Cape Cod, they were offloading whiskey all the time, probably in hyenas. You know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Made a lot of his money that way. <laughs> this is like something today. This is the drug deal. It's the, the lookout car, and you've got the guys ready to pick up the drugs. Here's a delivery. And, of course, with the advent of alcohol being illegal, all the bars and saloons went out of business. Maybe not. We got the speakeasies. And here's an example of a speakeasy. Now, speakeasies were supposed to be clandestine. They were supposed to be hidden. Uh, this one, nah, I don't know if that, that kind of looks like they're advertising something there. But if you look here, uh, this is how you usually got into a speakeasy. You knock on the door, right, and the little peephole opens. And he says, who sent you? Joe sent me, right? <laughs> you had to know somebody inside. The police sent me. Here are some actual speakeasies. Uh, sandwich shop, you go in the back room, there's a bar. Every town had them. And we don't know where they are, because they were all illegal and nobody wrote it down. That looks like an apartment building. Here's an old broken down storefront. These are all actual speakeasies. Now, I, I 
was online and I came across somebody saying that if you go to the Hotel Vernon in Worcester, it's a kind of a run-down, shabby hotel. Uh, the bar is on the first floor. And if you ask the bartender nicely, they'll take you to the speakeasy from the 1920s. It's down on, in the basement. And I actually found a picture online of that speakeasy. That you, if you ask nicely, they'll take you down in the dusty old speakeasy there. And as I said, drinking just became more rampant. And here are some shots of the interiors of those speakeasies. People having a great time. That martini pour. <laughs> yeah. Another thing was, you started seeing more women in the speakeasies uh, because they brought in business. This is uh, Texas Guinan. She was a former stage and silent screen star, and she had speakeasies all over New York, New York City. And when she was there as hostess, when people came in. She would greet them with, hello, suckers, because the alcohol was, was a lot more than it was before Prohibition. And you paid a lot for that alcohol. Now, just to show that she, uh, she didn't really have much to worry about from the, the officials in New York City. Uh, she had a special booth for this man. His name was Mayor Johnny Walker, no, no, no pun intended, yes. Johnny Walker had his own booth and uh, everything was roaring. But sometimes these speakeasies would be raided, maybe by prohibition agents. They, they weren't as much on the take as the local police. Sometimes the police would do it if you didn't pay your protection. Uh, and they'd come in and probably take some of it. As F. Scott Fitzgerald said, everybody's youth is a dream, a form of chemical madness. This was the 1920s. And with this illegal alcohol black market, we start to see the rise of the gangsters, the so-called mafia. Now, I'm gonna talk about two cities, New York and Chicago. Now, in New York, before Prohibition, you had these two guys. They were the old-time Sicilian Mafia Dons, uh, the, the younger uh, young Turks that would replace them called them the Mustache Peets. And they basically ran extortion. They'd uh, have shopkeepers pay protection so they didn't get their shop blown up. Uh, they ran gambling, prostitution. They were pretty small time. And when the 20s came, they couldn't keep up. And through, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but eventually they were replaced by this guy. There was a whole big war that went on, people switching sides and everything. And Lucky Luciano saw this, this as a corporation, this organized crime, and he decided to divide the territories among the different gang leaders in New York City and have a board, like a board of directors. And they would make decisions. And they would stay out of each other's territory because you can make money. If you're out there killing each other, you're not gonna make any money. So this is what he did. And he instituted what we now know as the modern day mafia. Another thing, the mafia was very insular as far as being Italian. You couldn't even deal, they wouldn't deal with anybody else. Luciano opened it up to people of other faiths, other nationalities. You couldn't be a made man, you had to be Italian, but you could associate with the mafia. Here we have Benjamin Bug Bugsy Siegel from the Bugs and Meyer gang. He was the muscle, he was somebody that would go and collect, and he became the famous Bugsy Siegel of Las Vegas, as we know. Uh, and also you had Meyer Lansky, who was the numbers man, this man was a genius as far as numbers. If he had gone legitimate, he'd probably be a corporate CEO and could have made it that way, but he chose to go into gambling and crime. And he was responsible for 
the casinos in Havana in the 1950s and then later Las Vegas. But in this early stage, they're just these gangsters, but they've organized. And this is why we have today the five crime families of New York City. And the mafia got so entwined into our society that I, don't, I still think we haven't pulled it out completely. It's still there. Over in Chicago, we had a mustache Pete. His name was Big Jim Colosimo. His specialty was prostitution. I think he had a hundred some odd brothels all around Chicago. Now this is kind of funny. He was being harassed by the Black Hand. This is like a proto-mafia group. And they were extorting him. And he needed some protection from somebody. So he called New York and they brought in Johnny Torrio, who was called the Fox. And he was brought in to end this extortion from the Black Hand in 1909. And a few years later, Johnny Torrio brought in another gangster from New York who was actually on the run. They were trying to kill him in New York, and he thought it would be a good idea to go to Chicago. Maybe you recognize this guy. Al Capone. <laughs> Young Al Capone. <coughs> Scarface. I think the scar was brand new about this time. So when Prohibition went into effect, Torrio said, Big Jim, we got to get in on this. It's going to be millions of dollars. For some reason, Big Jim said, no, we'll just stick to prostitution. Can you guess what happened to Big Jim? <laughs> yep, in the, in, in the 1920s parlance, he got bumped off. And on uh, May 11th, 1920, he had uh, Colosimo murdered. And it was probably by Al Capone, because Al Capone became the number two man in Chicago, under Torrio. Then a few years later, 1925, Torrio, there, there was an assassination attempt against Torrio. And I think he was shot like several times, but he survived. And he decided that it was a good time to retire. <laughs> and he went back to New York, and Al Capone became the number one man in the Italian outfit, as they called it back then. Now, they did not control the, the whole entire city. They controlled the south side of Chicago. The fellow that controlled the north side with his Irish gangsters was a fellow by the name of Dino Banyan or Dini O'Banion. And he uh, and Capone butted heads. They, they didn't agree on their territories. Each, each side was hijacking each side's uh, liquor shipments and all this stuff. And there were, there were gang shootings in the streets. And Capone decided that he had to leave, kind of like uh, Torrio. Now, the funny thing is, Dino Banyan was gangster by night, but during the day, he ran a florist shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the, all the dead gangsters, there was a lot of money in this with the flowers going to the, the funerals. He was making a lot of money. And one day, he was in his shop, and these, these fellas came in. They had ordered a floral arrangement for another gangster that got bumped off. And they were actually there to kill Johnny Torrio. Now, they knew. He, I think he carried like four guns and holsters all around his body. They knew they had to disable him somehow before he knew it. So they came in. One of them grabbed his hand to shake his hand and held it. So he's trying to get his hand back, and the other two came up behind and shot him right in his floral shop. Here's, here's uh, from a newspaper, a diagram that they, they would use to, used to put these little diagrams in. Now, this is from the movie St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which came out, I think, in the late 60s, showing the same event, the end of Johnny, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dean O'Banion. Here they are. Hi, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't get a chance. Now, Capone cut off the head of the North Side Gang, but that, that didn't stop. He was quickly replaced by a gangster named Bugs Moran with his henchman, Jaime Weiss. And for the next few years, there was just constant gang war between the North and the South. Bugs Moran's gang going in, Capone, there was bloodshed everywhere. And it all kind of ended with this. 
Yeah. St. Valentine's Day, 1929. All of, most of the heads of Bugs Moran's gang were in a garage in the north side near Lincoln Park. And uh, they were there for a meeting. It was set up. And Capone's men knew about it. Bugs Moran was actually on his way to come to the meeting. And a police car pulled up and uh, another car. Two policemen got out with two plainclothes policemen, what they thought. They came in and they told the men in the garage that this was an arrest. They were arresting them. Get up against the wall. We're going to frisk you. And they did that. They went up against the wall. They were ready to be arrested. And they pulled out the Tommy guns and they just mowed them all down. Now, conveniently, Al Capone was in Miami, Florida at this time, so he wasn't one of the shooters. We still really don't know today who, who did it. Plenty of people have stories about it. Here's that scene from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. If you go to Chicago today, you want to visit that spot, it's a parking lot. <laughs> okay. Parking lot. Oh. Now, Al Capone becomes the leader of the Chicago mob after this. Bugs Moran beat it out of town, and he controlled it all. Now, in 1923, President Harding dies, and his vice president, you remember Calvin Coolidge mm -hmm. is made the President of the United States and he was sworn in in Plymouth, Vermont by his father at, at the family home. His father was a magistrate. And uh, I was up there a couple years ago and notice the little lamp there, the room. It's still the same. And Calvin took over and here's another quote from Calvin. The chief business of uh, the American people is business. True conservative. Let's talk about some fun stuff now. Fashions and fads of the 1920s. Here you go. The flapper girl. Now, this is what I have here. The flappers were a subculture of young Western women in the 1920s that wore short skirts. They bobbed their hair, short hair, listened to jazz, flaunted their disdain for what was considered acceptable behavior. Flappers were seen as brash for wearing excessive makeup, <clears throat> drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes in public, and driving automobiles, treating sex in a casual manner, flouting societal norms. <clears throat> now, do, have you seen the kids with the big things in their ears and the, yeah. all the piercings and everything? This is just a continuation of this. Let's shock mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was recently speaking at a COA and I said, this is your parents' generation, right? Mm -hmm. And I said to them, I said, how many of your parents were flappers? Not one hand went up. <laughs> but imagine your daughter looking like that. <laughs> out were the old 19th century long locks, in were the short bobbed haircuts and they became very popular. They're still popular today. You still see women with this haircut. There's different variants of it, but the bobbed haircut. There you go. And there's the flapper girl. And look at that. <laughs> now in the 19th century, if you showed your ankle, that was scandalous. Now, the, you can you imagine the parents that are like, what? The, Everything's gone to heck in handbasket. Look at this, all these bathing suits. And, and the young flappers were wearing these bathing suits. They had bathing beauty contests in the city of sin, Atlantic City. Now, back home on the beaches, they tried doing this. And they had... 
The bathing suit police had to be four inches. As a teacher, we used to do this to the students. I wasn't the guy with the ruler, though. Um, and if it, it was short, too short, you're going to jail in the Hooskow. Now, men had fashions, too. There were some fashions. Uh, this is what's known as the Oxford pants. The Oxford shirt made it, stayed around. I'm glad that stayed in the 1920s. I guess it was a favorite among college men. Here it is. Wear your big baggy Oxford pants. Raccoon coats were all the rage. Uh, you'd wear that to the football game. And it's probably because they had numerous pockets on the inside. And you know what they kept in there, right? <clears throat> Hats. This is an age when men we're allowed to wear cool hats. Look at that, the straw boater, the fedora, the bowler. What's happened, guys? What, what do we, we have a choice of baseball hats or maybe a, a scally cap. And I, I, my, my little stocking cap that I wore. Men had fashion back then. Look at this, that's a baseball game. You think you'd see anybody with a tie at a baseball game today? <laughs> People got dressed up when they went out. Oh, excuse me. And then there was the dance craze, the Charleston. It swept the nation. It started, it was named after Charleston Harbor. The rhythm was popularized by mainstream dance music in the United States in 1923. There was a, a tune called the Charleston, which actually originated on Broadway in a show called Run and Watch. And here you see it, there's some folks doing the Charleston, cutting it up. And that is Josephine Baker at the Follies Berger in Paris, 1926. And she's doing my favorite move. I used to do that for my students, I loved it. And here's, here's a little snippet, a, a film clip of some people doing the Charleston. And there was another dance craze called dance marathons. And the object was to be the last, the last couple standing. And you won a prize. And it was all fun and games in the 1920s, but by the 1930s it became a way to make money. And people would do this just to make money because they were so destitute. And then we have the fads. Pole sitting was made popular by Alvin Shipwreck Kelly. He had a number of records I won't go through all of them, but his final record was set in 1930. He sat atop a pole uh, 220 feet high for 49 days and one hour in Atlantic City. I guess he got off it because there was a big electrical storm on its way. He thought it might be a good idea to get down. The pogo stick came in. Oh, this is Alvin. These are pictures of Alvin, sorry. These are some of the other records that he broke. He'd break the record and then somebody else would break it and he'd have to break it again. I don't, I don't know if he still holds it today. The pogo stick became famous during the 1920s. Here's another one. Goldfish swallowing. This was done among college men in fraternities. And uh, I look at, the. remember a few years ago kids were eating Tide Pods? Yeah, stupidity has no bounds. Yeah. They were stupid back then, too. <laughs> the crossword puzzle was a new invention. Oh. And many people enjoyed the game of Mahjong in real life, not just on their phones. <laughs> and I love this. This is the golden age of Hollywood, I think. The silent movie era. When you think of the silent movie era, I always think of Charlie Chaplin. He kind of personifies it for me. And. Here's one of his famous movies, The Kid. 
with Jackie Coogan. Wait, did he end up on the Munsters or the Adams Family, I think, years later? Um, yeah. Here's a clip from the kid, and it still holds today. You know, you can get these silent films on YouTube now. Now, he sends the kid out on an assignment. Ooh, what's he up to? And of course, you'd have the piano playing in the background. He's a glazier, if you didn't know. He's got a window strapped to his back. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh no, that's a horrible thing to send your kid to do. <laughs> oh, how convenient. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably one of the best physical comedians of the time was Roscoe Arbuckle, called Fatty Arbuckle. I guess you couldn't do that today, right? Um, he was over 300 pounds, but he was nimble and very athletic for his size. Here's some clips of him. Watch this. He was the highest paid actor in Hollywood during his, the height of his career. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll catch a train now. Yeah. Now, talking about physical comedians, you can't beat Buster Keaton. And his career lasted until the 1960s. Um, Here's a short clip. You have stuntmen do this stuff now. He did all of his stunts. I love this. Here's some more clips. I'll, I'll leave it up there for a few minutes because each of these is him doing an individual stunt. And he had to be right on. How about this one? He's, uh, he's knocking out this. What would happen if he missed? Whole train had to it. Maybe it was made out of paper mache or something. I don't know. But that's Buster Keaton. And of course, you had your first sex symbol, Clara Bow. She was the it girl. She had that certain it that attracted men, that undescribable thing. Here's another shot of her. The first sex symbol of the cinema. <laughs> and of course, you have to have the girl next door and that was Mary Pickford. She was called America's Sweetheart. During the silent era, she was the girl with the curls, and uh, she was probably the most popular actress from the 1910s to the 1920s. She was also called the queen of the movies. And the original action hero, Douglas Fairbanks, swashbuckler extraordinaire. He played pirates, he played Zorro, uh, all the uh, all the uh, sword fights and things like that. He also, as, as in his tenure, he started the Motion Picture Academy. He started United Artists. He he hosted the first Academy Awards. He was known as the King of Hollywood, the King and the Queen, Mary, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, and they built this house called Pick Fair, and that's where all the actors would come and they would party. It was the height of the 1920s, if you can imagine that. And did I talk about the male sex symbol? Rudolph Valentino, the Latin lover, the great lover. Here are some of his movies, The Apocalypse, The Four Horsemen, The Sheik, Blood in the Sand, The Eagle, The Son of the Sheik. Sadly, he died in early death. Thousands came out to his funeral. And for a long time, a lone woman with a rose would come out to his grave every year on the anniversary of his death and place it there. And how can we talk about the jazz age without talking about jazz? Now, where did jazz start? Started in New Orleans, Louisiana. And this is Jelly Roll Martin. He claimed to be the inventor of jazz. He started his career off as a piano player in a bordello. And he started doing this up-tempo music that he called jazz. Now, it's so early. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a clip called the Jelly Roll Blues. You can kind of hear a tinge of Dixieland here. Dixon. 
Odyssey land there. This was a, a new type of music. It was improvisational, it was raw, it had emotion. This is the King Oliver Creole Jazz Band, again from New Orleans. They became the biggest jazz band of the era. And they had the cream of New Orleans jazz players, among them was Louis Armstrong. Let's give it a listen. also became one of the biggest jazz men in the 1920s, the 30s, all the way up into the 1960s. Anybody remember It's a Wonderful Life? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Satchmo, the Satch Pops. Here he is in an early song. The next time we're going to swing for you, he's going to do good old favorite. That's uh, Dinah, Dinah, they got them on. Are you ready? Yeah. 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 Paul Whiteman Orchestra. As leader of one of the most popular dance bands in the United States during the 20s and early 30s, Whiteman produced records that were immensely successful. Press notices often referred to him as the king of jazz. Detractors suggested that his ornately orchestrated music was jazz in name only. It lacked the improvisational and emotional depth and many said he co-opted the innovations of black musicians. Oddly enough, his name was Whiteman. <laughs> Listen to this, you see, see if you hear any difference. I think this is what Pat Boone was to the rock and roll. And then finally, one of the great composers of all time, George Gershwin, came on and on the scene. And he, like Whiteman, took jazz, but he mixed it with classical music and came up with a new sounding jazz. This is Rhapsody in Blue, and you can hear what's to come. You can hear the swing music. You can hear the big bands in this. Halt. Chris, you asked for a heads up at 7.30. Okay. This is it. It's almost over. Um, Herbert Hoover is elected president on March 4th, 1929. He's inaugurated. Shortly after that, we get the stock market crash. Uh, Black Tuesday. And you know what happened after that. Panic. The stocks plummet. Many people lost millions of dollars. This is Wall Street on, on that day. And America is thrown into the Great Depression. And you see, this is before social services. This is before welfare. There were bread lines. 
people were scrounging for jobs. I see this and I think of my grandfather. My dad said that he used to stand on the street corner and sell cigarettes. And if they didn't have any food around, they'd go scrounging in the backyard for dandelions to make a dandelion salad. Mm -hmm. This was the 1930s. There was no safety net. Because of the 1930s, we have the safety nets. Mm -hmm. And Franklin Roosevelt was elected. The New Deal came in. It mitigated the Great Depression somewhat, but the Great Depression lasted seriously. It did not end until the beginning of World War II because there was lots of jobs. And thank you for coming out tonight. be happy to take some questions. Yes, if there are any comments or questions. Well, on the prohibition end. Uh, prohibition ended in, I think, 33, under the Roosevelt administration. Okay. They, uh, first they got, like, uh, O'Doul's beer they could drink, <laughs> it was yeah. like beer beer or something, and then finally they, they started, you could drink all the alcohol. Yeah, so it ended uh, under, with the repeal, I think it was the 21st Amendment that repealed the 18th Amendment. Yes. Why the uh, the Senate wouldn't pass the League of Nations? What what was? It was I think the feeling that let's stop getting involved in all their problems. Why why do we want to get involved in that with this League of Nations? And a, a lot of them wanted just to focus on the United States. Uh, and I don't know uh, I don't know the margin that it didn't pass by. I should look that up. Maybe it was close. Yes, very good, thank you. <laughs> All right, see, I want something. That's what your slides are, I think. What's that? The newspaper article? Yeah. Yes. Um, you are an expert on Lizzie Borden, and I just yes. wondered about the years uh, that particular con took place and how you got into that, that. Oh, that happened in 1892. She lived until the, the 20s. She died in 27. Um, I got interested in it, uh, to tell you the truth, when I was a kid I watched the Elizabeth Montgomery movie. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? The main TV movie where Lizzie Borden strips down naked and kills everybody. That's how she got away with it. But the funny thing is, when I, was, when I first started getting into it, I went down to the Fall River Historical Society. I was in my 20s. And I met For Florence Brigham, who was 92. She knew Lizzie Borden. And the dummy that I was, I said, what do you think about her doing it naked? And, and Mrs. Brigham went, oh, this was the Victorian era. She would have been caught dead running around naked. She'd rather be convicted of murder. So <laughs> I, I did. I, I used to go down. I, real, I found out the house still existed before it was a bed and breakfast. Uh, I created this lecture just out of... Uh, my own interest in this was back when I had this old slide projector, you know, that shh. Um, and it's really evolved over the years. I've been doing it for like 30 years now, and it's, it's come a long way. A lot of research, I've read all the trial transcripts, the police interviews. Uh, I've talked to people who are more knowledgeable than me, and uh, it, it can become an obsession. And there are a lot of people that are obsessed with it. I stopped. I, Yes. Um, how about understanding the dovetailing of the rise of um, suffrage for women yes. during this time? That right. That's something uh, obviously I couldn't do. Yeah, everything. I mean, you can't do everything. Yeah, that would be an yeah. interesting. And pro the suffragette movement, with also the prohibition movement, there, there were connections, connections there. Connections, yeah. And the suffragettes were also connected with the old abolitionists too, uh, and that finally came to fruition in. You know, I, I tell my kids, uh, I used to teach eighth grade uh, government, and I'd, I'd say to them, do you know there are people alive today that were alive when women couldn't vote? Mm -hmm. And I was shocked also, I served on jury duty. Women were not allowed to sh serve on ju jury duties in Massachusetts until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it was, there are a lot of things. So when I yeah. graduated college, my father said the first thing you do is get a credit card because my mother couldn't get a credit card, right. you know, yeah. before, and that was like, 
moving forward in this society. Women couldn't own property. If your husband died, your oldest son got it. And if you were lucky, he'd let you stay in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, I think the, the flapper movement and everything. Yes. That the modern came, woman. That came yeah. into like women just asserting their rights and right. trying to break away. Right. Um, and that, that social construct within society, that's yes. what I would be interested in that. Yeah, that, that could be a whole lecture on to itself, whole lecture, actually. Yeah. Yes. Take your next one. Yes. <laughs> and they were really the progenitors of, uh, you know, the women in the 60s, you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. they, they were, this was really the first decade of the, of the 20th century. Seriously, the 1920s, the first modern decade. And a lot of us had, like my grandmother, you know, was born in 1904, so, you know, just seeing that mm -hmm change within yeah. her life. All know, those changes that we saw. My grandmother was born around the same time. Yeah. And, you know, just amazing. Horse and buggy and no yeah. planes. No cars and to... They would have been shocked. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Some would how much right. change they did see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 the change in the um, society, I mean, like we saw the girls with the short skirts and all that stuff. I think some of those elders were pretty shocked. Yes. I just wanted to put a vote in for visiting um, uh, Coolidge's birthplace in Plymouth Union, New Hampshire. Yes. It's just such a great It's a little change. village. Yeah. And it's not that far <laughs> from here. It's, no. it's just really amazing when you walk in this little yep. village and you think a U.S. president came from this. Right. And he lived in here. The yeah. cemetery so too. humble. He's right. right. He's in the cemetery not too far from here, too. Yeah. And it, it, they call him Silent Cal, and he's kind of one of these presidents that they skip over because he really, he was, he was quiet, but he, he uh, had what a great er, uh, work ethic and where he came from, what he did, and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was Charles Lindbergh in the 20s also? Yeah. <coughs> Lucky Lindy. Uh, yes, that flight was done in the 1920s. Um, am I thinking 27? I think it was. 27, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he made it. There was a flight from Paris to New York. Two pilot, two fighter pilots from World War One that got lost. They don't know where they are. They just disappeared. Never landed in New York. And then two weeks later, Lindy lands in the same field that they took off from. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they've taken those um, silent films, and they're all digitized yes. now. And I'm a theater organist. Mm -hmm. So we accompany, I mean, I don't do it, yeah. but mm -hmm. friends of ours, I mean, that's a specialty, to sit there. Yes. And so I was talking to one of the fellows one day, and I said, how many times did you watch it? <laughs> he said, I watched it for 15 hours wow. on his iPad, <laughs> propped up on the internet, to accompany it. and just watched and played, because you have to be there. Yeah, you need to know no. when to hit those Explosion. notes. Yeah. Right. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. you know when to have it's, the crescendo. It's all timing, right. Yeah. So it was interesting. Wow. So they I, show those now? You do them at the some of the, we do. some of the older theaters do that. They yeah. have like silent movie night. Right. And you're lucky right. if you have somebody like that. Yeah, we do. The Hanover does them occasionally. Oh, they do? Yeah. 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 Oh, great. But we, um, huh. many years ago, we threw the organ the theater organ, which is different than the church organ. Um, we saw the first silent movie that made the Academy Awards. It was oh. called Wings. Wings. And it was so long that there was an intermission. Huh. <laughs> and and it's like boy meets girl, boy goes off to war, and the choo, choo, oh, you the, know, with the shooting, yeah. and then <laughs> and the guy goes on the keyboard when, when the plane <laughs> crash. Yeah. 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 And then all of a sudden the lights go on for yeah. intermission and it goes on. Yes. <laughs> they, 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 so they're caught still up today. Up. Yeah. You get so caught up in the, in yeah. the music. Isn't that you know? amazing? It's yeah. And they, they had to, it wasn't like today, you have dialogue that carries everything. They, they had to be very oh, yeah. physical and act everything out. Yeah. Right, turn the camera. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, delightful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We learned a great deal. That is wonderful. I hope that you 
read your calendar and come to our other programs, as I said, first Mondays of the month. Next one is a special one for our Black History Month, the Underground Railroad in Central Massachusetts, which would be by Professor Susan Franz. So I think you'll be very interested in that it's a great subject, but it is now a subject here and what was going on uh, the abolition then of the Underground Railroad right in this area. Please check out your calendars and so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.